Very good to see you all here this morning. We'd like you to open your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Second Timothy 3, we'll begin here in just a moment as we continue in our series of studies on rock-solid faith. This series of studies is chiefly intended for those who are younger to help build up their faith, to give them a good foundation of understanding about God, about His Word. But those of us who are older are not immune to the influence and the pressures of the culture around us. So we want to be reminded of things perhaps that we've learned in years past and strengthen our faith and be encouraged by the truth that is revealed in the Word of God. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, it says here, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Word of God, it says here, is inspired, or as you probably know, God breathed. That is, it comes from the mouth of God. He is the one who has spoken it. So when we open up the Word of God, we know that He spoke it. He is the author of it. There are many different writers of the Bible, but the one behind it all, the one who has revealed it all, given it to us, is God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 1 Corinthians 2, verses 10 and 11, it says, But God has revealed them to us through His Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of man except the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. So we get a glimpse into the process of revelation there, how that the Holy Spirit searched out the mind of God, and then the Holy Spirit gave that mind, that will, that message to man, and man proclaimed it, whether it's man proclaiming it, preaching it, or man writing it down and sending it in letters, which is what we have before us today, being preserved down through the ages. Now, this Word of God, that is the inspired Word of God, has been attacked. It has been criticized. It has been doubted, and it has been looked at as a collection of myths. There are those in the world around us who say, well, what the Bible actually is, is a bunch of Hebrew writings through the years that they made up stories as to why the world is here, why man is here, how man ought to live, and they compiled all of that, and it's just a series of myths, like you might find writings among the Chinese or the ancient Babylonians, that it's just something somebody made up, and it has some good wisdom in it, but it is not the Word of God. It is not divinely inspired, not divinely revealed. They would look at the Bible and say that it is historically inaccurate. That the people or the events that the Bible claims to have happened and the times in which it claims that those things have happened or individuals lived, they would say, well, those are inaccurate. That either those people never lived, those societies never existed, or the events didn't happen in the time frame in which the Bible talks about it. So it would say, well, the Bible is historically inaccurate. The critics would say that it's scientifically unreliable. In fact, they go so far as to say that there is science and the Bible. And they contradict each other. And they use science as their standard. And they, use, they look at the Bible as something that, again, man has made up. And where the Bible touches on science, it's inaccurate at best and it is contradictory and foolish at worst. Of course, I hope that our previous lessons, when we looked at rock-solid faith and science in the Bible and things like that, that we've seen that true science actually agrees with the Bible. In fact, the Bible revealed things that we've only scientifically discovered in relatively recent times. But be that as it may, there are critics who say that the Bible contradicts science. They say that 
Well, since the Bible has been translated, that there's been all these copies made, and these copies have been passed on down through the centuries, that the translation we have today is not an accurate representation of what was originally revealed, that it is inaccurate, and we cannot trust what is written here and believe that it is actually what was originally put down, what was originally declared to the world. They say it's been corrupted over time. And they would also look at the Bible and say, well, you know, when you look into the Bible and you read in one book and you see one thing, you read another book, there's another thing. And so there's all these contradictions in the Bible. So it's unreliable. It's untrustworthy. Well, the book called A Study Course in Christian Evidences says it essentially boils down to these ideas or to this idea. The Bible is either inspired or it is not. There's no in-between. It's, it's not like, well, we could say that the red letters are inspired and all the black letters are maybe questionable. It's not like we can have a middle ground here. It's either inspired or it's not. Now, as we read a while ago, the Bible claims inspiration. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. When you look into the book of Psalms, in Psalm 119, Psalm 119, remember that great psalm that is really dedicated to elevating the Word of God, to extolling its great virtues. In Psalm 119, if you notice here in verse 137, Psalm 119, 137, Righteous are you, O Lord, and upright are your judgments. Your testimonies which you have commanded are righteous and very faithful. 140, your word is very pure, therefore your servant loves it. 142, your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness. Your law is truth. Your law is truth. What is written here in the word, it declares it is truth. So the Bible claims for itself inspiration. It is lauded as being great. And what we want to do is look at the evidence to see, is the Bible something that is trustworthy? Is it reliable? Can we look at it and say it is indeed the inspired revelation of the mind of God? The evidence for the validity, the accuracy, and the reliability of the Bible is overwhelming. To begin with, we think of a test or a process that historians use on any ancient document. So if there is something written in the time of Alexander the Great or something written during Julius Caesar's time, or you go back further than that, you go back to the pharaohs of Egypt, if you find writings, you find documents, whether that's on parchment or whether it's on stone, they go back and they look at it and they apply a certain test to these things to decide is it accurate and is it reliable? Do we have what was originally put down? And the three tests that they apply to this, and this is found in evidences that demand a verdict, are the biographical, the internal, or the bibliographical, sorry, the bibliographical, the internal and the external tests. And here's what they are, the bibliographical test looks at are the documents accurate copies? So has it been reliably transmitted down through the centuries? So what we have now is what was originally written down before. And then there's the internal test. Does the document disqualify itself by internal contradictions or known factual inaccuracies? So look internally, is that document consistent, coherent? Does what it has within it ring with truth, with what is accurate, right, factual, if you will? The external test is do other historical materials confirm or deny the internal testimony provided by the document? So we're going to go through these very briefly as we think about the inspired Word of God. Now, when you look at the Word of God and you think about this bibliographical test about has it been accurately transmitted down through the ages, the Bible 
is the most reliable ancient document that exists. There is not anything that comes close. There are over 24,000 New Testament manuscripts from ancient times. Now, that word manuscript simply means copy. So the original, so if you were to, to look at the Psalms, let's say, the original one that David put pen to paper on is called the autograph. Or where Paul wrote on parchment or Peter. That's the autograph copy. When they then took that and made a copy, that is called the manuscript. So we have copies of the original. That's what we're talking about with 24,000 New Testament manuscripts either in part or in whole. So it might be one chapter, it might be one verse, it might be a few words out of a verse, or it might be the entire book or the entire New Testament, entire Old Testament, if you're talking about Old Testament things, but we're focused on the New Testament right now. There are over 5,300 Greek manuscripts. And the reason that's important is because if you know your Bible history, like the book itself, it was originally revealed and written in Greek. Remember that in the New Testament times, in the first century, Greek was the dominant universal language. And so when they revealed it, when they wrote it down, it was written in Greek. And then, of course, it was copied in Greek, so it had the greater distribution. So over 5,300 in Greek. Now there's over 10,000 Latin, which was the official language of Rome and became a dominant language, very uh, widespread in the times from the New Testament going forward. It, it grew over that time. So you have over 10,000 manuscripts in Latin. You have over 4,000 in Slavic, so you get more up into the European countries. So it began to be copied more and more up there. But over 24,000 total. Now something else that is looked at is the time span between the original, the autograph, and the first known copy, the earliest known copy. For the Bible, that time span is about 25 years. They've narrowed it down to that span. So you look at the Bible being written from around 40, the New Testament rather, between about 40 A.D. and 96 A.D. The earliest known copies go back into the early 2nd century, so 125, 130 A.D., somewhere around in there. So about 25, maybe 50 years, somewhere in there is the time span between the original and the earliest known copy to exist. Now compare that to something like the writings of Julius Caesar. Now he lived in the first century B.C. And he wrote about all of his adventures and different types of things that he went on, the wars, the campaigns he was involved in. The earliest known copy dates back to around 900 A.D. So if you take, let's say, 50 B.C., thereabouts, and 900 A.D., you have close to a thousand years between the original and the earliest known copies. If you look at Homer and his writing of the Iliad, and he is by far outside the Bible, from what I've seen, the best attested one, because Homer and the Iliad, he wrote around 900 B.C. The earliest known copy is 400 B.C., so you have a 500-year time span. As far as I know, that's the shortest of the list that I have here. So there's about 500 years between the two. Now the things that we have written by Julius Caesar, the account of the Iliad by Homer and other writings that he had, modern historians and scholars say we have an accurate copy, an accurate representation of what they originally wrote. I mean, they teach entire college courses on these things. Right? They write novels and things based off of these things. Because they say this is accurate here. They write books, if you will, biographies, if you will. So, 
they have all that evidence for those things, but the evidence for the Bible is even more so. Think about a thousand years, or think about 500 years compared to about 25 or 50 years. And then think about all the copies. And I know this is kind of hard to see, but of Caesar's works, 10. 10. But we say, oh, we have an accurate copy. And of Homer, 643. And I'm trying to give a relative scale as to how much that is. With the Bible, I couldn't do 24,000 all in one column. So I had to break it up into the various <coughs> ones. So Slavic, Greek, and Latin. And you look at the evidence for the Bible, all the manuscripts, all the copies that we have, and it's overwhelming. It far exceeds any other ancient document. Yet they'll tell us, well, we're not so sure about the Bible. You know what that says? It says they're dishonest. That's what that says. They have an agenda to try to undermine the Bible, the Word of God. Now what about the text itself and whether it's accurate, whether it's reliable? whether it's been transmitted down or maybe somebody who was copying it made a mistake. I mean, I make mistakes just when I sit down to write a note and then sometimes I have to scratch it out or sometimes I have to start over again because I made a mistake. I misspelled something or whatever may happen like that. Well, in the Iliad, there are 15,600 lines of text. 764 of those are in question. So that gives about a 5% questionable rate, right? 5%. The New Testament, by comparison, has 20,000 lines. 40 of those are questioned. So that's a point five. To put it another way, the Bible is 10 times more reliable than the Iliad as far as its accuracy in transmission down through the centuries. So the Bible is accurate. The Bible we have is a reliable transmission down through the centuries. Now, there's a man by the name of Fitton Hort who he looked at the Bible, he's a scholar or was a scholar, lived many years ago and he looked at it and he said, okay, when it comes down to it, there's about an eighth that he saw in his analysis, an eighth of what is written that is questionable but they form the greater part of that questionable is trivialities. They're small things. It's, it's not something that's a big deal that really affects the meaning or the message of the document. Now later, there are two men who came along, Geisler and Nix, who said, well, when Hort talked about the eighth, all those things, if you look at that then, you're talking about mechanical matters such as spelling or style. Now think about that. Instead of there, T-H-E-R-E, -E, T-H-E-I-R. Right? So if somebody's writing and they're writing fast, you do it, I do it. Maybe you don't do it, but I do it. I might get there and there mixed up just, you know, typing out real fast. It's a simple spelling mistake, but when you look at the sentence, you understand what that's supposed to be. And that's what they're talking about. Those inaccuracies, they pretty much boil down to trivialities. Something that is not that significant. In fact, by their estimation, as far as the Bible and its transmission, 98.33% pure, if you will. They give an example, or there's an example given of Isaiah chapter 53. There's 166 words, 17 letters that are in question out of those 166 words. Ten letters are spelling differences. Four letters are stylistic differences. So there's three letters left that are really where the question is in the entire chapter of Isaiah 53. And it's in one word that is translated as light. In the Septuagint version, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, it is put that way. So there's evidence to say it is accurate. But there's other manuscripts that say, mm, not so sure that's exactly that word right there. But whether it's that word or it's some other word doesn't affect the message of that chapter. And that's the point of these questionable texts. 
in the Bible, it doesn't change the meaning. It doesn't affect the doctrine. It's not like, oh, if you change that, if you believe that alternate variant that's found in this copy, well, God doesn't exist. That's not what it's talking about. Jesus isn't the Christ. It's not what's happening. It's very minor, very insignificant differences. Again, what we have is an accurate transmission of what was originally written down in the first century. Now there is also what's called the internal test. Again, how does it look internally? Well, first of all, in Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Let's just notice what the Bible claims for itself. And recall that the books of the Bible were all written independently and then they were compiled together. So in Luke chapter 1, verse 1, he says, Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered to us, delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you in an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus. So Luke says there were eyewitnesses to these events. People who were there, who saw what happened, who conveyed these accounts. Luke researched and went and talked to these individuals and he recorded these things down so that we have, as he said, for Theophilus, an orderly account about the life of Christ. So these are eyewitness accounts in 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. Remember verse 16, For we do not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of His majesty. Over in 1 John, 1 John chapter 1, verse 3. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. So he talks about this idea that we have seen, we have heard Christ. Peter says we were eyewitnesses. Luke says I talked to eyewitnesses and I have their accounts. Today, today in the court of law, Eyewitness testimony is some of the most powerful testimony there is. People go and say, here's what I saw, here's what happened. And we judge people whether they are guilty or innocent, whether they go to prison and maybe even to death row because of eyewitness testimony. It's powerful. And what we have in the Word of God, we see many occasions this is eyewitness testimony. And when you look at the testimony that is given, you see how that it is harmonious. When you go to Galatians chapter 1, there's a very important principle that's laid out here. In Galatians 1 verses 8 and 9, he says this, But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. Do you know what the Apostle Paul is saying there? He's saying that truth agrees with truth. He's telling the Galatians, look, we came and we preached the gospel to you. So you received what was originally given. Paul being inspired of God to go and preach the truth, he says, we preach that gospel to you and you receive that gospel. Now, if somebody comes along with something different, you don't accept that. Because truth agrees with truth. So think about this. When you look into the New Testament, you see that it harmonizes. The gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Are there differences in those books? Yes, there are differences. Just like if you go to a court of law and you bring up four witnesses to an event that unfolded, 
you're going to get four different perspectives on what happened. Maybe it's a bank robbery. Maybe it's a carjacking. You're going to get four different accounts. And if all four of the accounts agree exactly, like they use the same words, the same order, they, they give everything exactly the same, then the defense attorney and the judge are going to go, this is a setup. Because they've all gotten together and they've made up the same story. They're all sticking to that same script. It ain't true. But differences lend credibility. And that's what we see in the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And if you broaden it out to all of the Bible, that's what you see. Yes, there are some differences in there. But they actually lend to the credibility of the Word of God, to its reliability. You know, John does not contradict Paul. And Paul does not contradict Luke. And Luke doesn't contradict John. And John doesn't contradict Peter. Or anyone else. Moses. Or Jeremiah. Or Ezekiel for that matter. They do not contradict each other. They harmonize with one another. And they complement one another. There is internal agreement in the Word of God. Now as far as the external test goes, you look at outside documents. Are there other things out there that confirm or affirm or also record what is written in the Bible? And the answer to that is yes. Josephus, an ancient historian, Jewish historian, writes about John the baptizer. You know, Jesus' cousin who was his forerunner. He calls him by name. He recorded about Herod's arrest, his imprisonment, about his execution by Herod. And he recorded his influence among the Jews. How he was believed to be a prophet. He was powerful. He was influential among them. Josephus recorded those things. And Josephus was not a friend of Christianity. But he recorded, yes, this historical figure, John, lived and here's the events of his life. So there's external confirmation of what the Bible records. Then there is archaeological evidence. Let's go to Romans chapter 16. Romans 16. I find this one to be interesting because as you read Romans 16 verse 23, there's just like a casual reference here to an individual. Romans 16 23, it says, Guy is my host. My, uh, Guy is my host and the host of the whole church greets you. Erastus, the treasurer of the city, greets you. And Quartus, a brother. Okay, what's the big deal about these men? Well, Paul is writing to Rome from Corinth, and he says, Erastus, the treasurer of the city. Well, in 1929, they were doing excavations in Corinth, and they found a pavement stone that said this, Erastus, curator of public buildings, laid this pavement stone at his own expense. And they date that to the first century. So it's saying that this Erastus, when it says creator of public buildings, he was city treasurer. He was the guy who handled all the money and all that stuff for the city and ensured that those public buildings were built and made. Well, he put a little memorial to himself in there. You know, people do it all the time. You go on a college campus, you got people's names all over these buildings. That's simply what he was doing. Well, he's mentioned in Romans 16, 23. There's archaeological evidence to say he lived, he was there, he was in Korea, here is his occupation, here's what he was involved in. In Acts chapter 18, Acts chapter 18, there's another interesting account here. Acts chapter 18, and when you read verses 4 through 7 here, it talks about Paul and his work among the Jews there in particular. It says he reasoned with them in the synagogue every Sabbath, and persuaded both Jews and Greeks when Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ but when they opposed him and blasphemed he shook his garments and said to them your blood be upon your own heads I am clean from now on I will go to the Gentiles and he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justice one who worshipped God whose house was next door to the synagogue next door to the synagogue the idea is that it, it shared a wall with the synagogue. Right, so there were critics who for many years said, 
Jews do not build or did not build synagogues in the housing district. They built it somewhere else. Well, guess what happened? They went digging around and they found where synagogues were in housing districts. See, usually when they come out with criticisms about the Word of God, somewhere along the way, somebody takes a shovel, digs up some dirt, digs up some old stuff, and it confirms exactly what is written in the Bible. Now, what about the historical Jesus? Jesus of Nazareth. Did He live or did He not live? You know there are people who say Jesus actually never lived. There was no one ever by the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Not the one recorded in the Word of God. That's a myth that His apostles came up with. They created this character called Jesus. Well, when you look into historical documents, there is a Cornelius Tacitus. He was a Roman historian. Lucian of Samosata. Samos... Lucian. We'll stick with that. Flavius Josephus, who is that Jewish historian. Suetonius. Plinius Secundus, who is Pliny the Younger. You look at all these other historians and they know the fact about this Jesus of Nazareth being a prophet, living in Israel, being a thorn in the side of the Israel, Israeli leaders and authorities. They write all these different points of data down about the life of Jesus Christ and it just confirms what the Bible says about Him. So yes, Jesus of Nazareth lived exactly as the New Testament declares. There are independent historical accounts to prove His existence. So it passes the external test. Well, what about translation? Because this is one that people wrestle with. Well, if it's been copied all these times and it's been translated from one language into another language into another language and it's finally gotten to 21st century English, then how do we know it's actually what was originally said and all of that? Well, something I want you to notice in Deuteronomy chapter 17, Deuteronomy chapter 17, let the Bible testify of itself, if you will. You know, if you went to court and you are accused of a crime, you would want to give testimony, right? Want to defend yourself, of course, unless you're guilty. But if you're innocent, you want to testify. You want to say, hey, I'm innocent and here's what happened. Well, in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 18, in reference to kings and how kings were to behave, it says, Also it shall be when he sits on the throne of his kingdom that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book for from one of the before the priests, the Levites. So the Bible itself directed the kings to make copies of the law for themselves. So they're told, go and make copies. Now, we'll come back to this idea in a minute, but if God's telling them to make copies, then are copies reliable? Yeah. And it says, get one from the priest. Well, one means there's more. It's not like there's just one copy that the priest had. They had many copies of God's Word. In Proverbs chapter 25, verse 1, Proverbs 25, verse 1, notice this interesting mention here. It says, These also are Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied. So there were copies being made by the men of Hezekiah of what Solomon had written and revealed. And you go on down through the Bible, you explore that, you look at Nehemiah. In Nehemiah's day, the people ask Ezra, Ezra, get a copy of the law and come and read that to us. Well, that was about 1,200 years after Moses wrote down the law initially. They didn't have the autograph copy that Moses had, right? That he wrote. They had copies of copies of copies over a 1,200 year period. In Mark chapter 7, Mark chapter 7, I would like you to look at this 
reference here, this quote from the Old Testament. This is Jesus in Mark 7, verses 6 and 7. He answered and said to them, Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Now you probably have that offset in your Bible indicating that it is a quote from Old Testament Scripture, as it says here from Isaiah. Now I'm not a scholar, but scholars tell us that that quote is from the Septuagint version of the Old Testament. Now, the Septuagint version is the Greek translation that was made in Alexandria, Egypt some 200 plus years before Jesus came into the world. Okay, so think about this. You have the law that was revealed somewhere in the 15th century B.C. You have it translated from Hebrew and Aramaic into Greek around 250, 220, somewhere in there B.C. Jesus quotes from that translation in His teaching. Same thing was true with Stephen. In Acts chapter 7, verse 14, He quotes from the Septuagint version. That was one that was commonly found in synagogues in various places. That tells us that the Lord believed the copies and the translations were accurate enough, reliable enough to use in His teaching. And the teaching of men who were inspired to proclaim His Word. So what we have today is something in which we can put our trust and confidence. If you will, open to number 810. 810. And if you will listen to what I'm going to read out of 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22, beginning. 1 Peter 1, 22. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. Because all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of the grass. The grass withers, and its flower falls away. But the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. And God promised that His word would be with us for all time. He declares it is that word that lives and abides forever. And it essentially boils down to this, to something similar that we talked about a while ago. Look, God either exists or He doesn't. It's one or the other. And God either loves us or He does not love us. It's one or the other. And God either revealed His will to us or He did not. And either God is powerful enough to preserve that will down through the ages or he's not. And you have to choose either one side of those things or the other. You can't pick one and leave the other out. You can't say, well, God exists, and say, well, I, I don't think we have his word. Well, that's a God that doesn't love us. That's a God that doesn't have power. Who wants to believe in that kind of God? He either exists or he doesn't. He loves us or he doesn't. He's revealed his will or he hasn't. He's powerful enough to preserve it for us today, or He's not. When you look at the evidence, you have to come to the conclusion that God has revealed His will, and we do have it before us even this day. If the Bible is not the all-inspired and errant Word of God, then such a thing as that does not exist. We're free to do as we wish, and that's what the critics really want to get to. They want to cause doubt. They want to undermine. They want to degrade the Word of God because they want to follow their own selfish desires. They want to do what they want to do, when they want to do it, create their own laws, live by their own moral standard, and not by one that God has laid down because they don't want to be accountable. 
But God has revealed that this is His standard and we must live by it because we're going to give an account to Him on the great day of judgment. If you're not ready today to give an account, then won't you make a change? Won't you confess that you believe Jesus is the Christ as the Word of God declares? Won't you repent of your sins? Won't you be baptized to have your sins washed away? You will then be born again, born anew, pure and clean in fellowship with God and looking forward to that day of judgment instead of fearing it. And if you're a child of God and you've weakened, you've wavered, you've gone back into the world, won't you repent of that? If there's something you need to confess publicly, then do that. Confess it. Let us pray with you and pray for you. And God will forgive you. God will restore you to Himself. If you need to respond, please come now while we stand and sing.